Hello out there in Radio Land. This is Michael. This is Street Preacher's Corner Podcast, the podcast where our motto, our philosophy, is boots on the ground and face in the Bible. Well, last night we went down to uh, downtown Brunswick, Georgia to preach at the First Friday Festival. Uh, it is a frequent haunt of ours, and in October, in First Friday, there's always uh, people dressed up for Halloween because apparently Americans cannot tell the difference between the first of October and the last of October. And so they dress up, and they walk around uh, downtown Brunswick in their costumes. And I've noticed, you know, the Bible says light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light, for their deeds were evil. And the Bible says that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. And as time has gone on in my time in the ministry, I've noticed that uh, the costumes get darker. And so in times past, you'd have people leading their kids around. The kids would be dressed as ladybugs, or, or and there was one kid last night that was dressed as a ladybug. That's why it sticks out in my mind. But overall, last night, the theme was uh, witches. Witches and devils. And uh, this one girl did have a uh, her dog dressed as Crypto the Super Dog, which, you know, is a pretty solid costume. But although the dog was having some real struggles with the cape. But there was a girl down there last night that had this very interesting costume, and she had stilts on her legs, or on her feet, and stilts on her hands, and she had uh, basically what looked like fur and a tail, and she had her face painted white, she had uh, black lipstick and fangs and horns coming out of her forehead, and so she was walking around on all fours on stilts, uh, sort of leering at people from above and posing for pictures. And I don't know what she's supposed to be. Maybe the world's tallest goat. I don't know. But there it is. Well, uh, here we are. Uh, we're part two of Husbands and Wives. And we're going to go to Ephesians 5 to start off with. Um, you know, I, I expected a lot of backlash when I talked about the wives. Because when you preach this in person, when you cover the material on wives in person, you do get a lot of dirty looks. You do get a lot of... Uh, uh, death daggers from the eyes from the women in the audience and um you have to decide you don't care you have to decide that you're not going to be afraid of their faces this is part of of the ministry part of preaching is to not be afraid of their faces whether they be man whether they be woman whether they be boy whether they be girl <laughs> and so i expected based on previous uh, encounters i had preaching that sort of stuff in person that i would get some backlash that the sort of people who would give me Deadly dagger eyes uh, would write mean things in the comment section, and that did not happen. And I really kind of wondered why. I was like, you know, and then I realized the demographics of my YouTube channel include almost no women. So there's that. But here we are in Ephesians five. We're covering the husband portion of the husbands and wives. We're going to read the entire passage, and then we're going to zero in on the husbands. Uh, Ephesians 5, starting at verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so that wives be their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ, and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you, in particular, so love his wife, even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now we talked about the wives before, but now it's the we have to come to the husbands. And oddly enough, I am less inclined to parse my words and less concerned about the fallout. In verse twenty-five, the Bible do say, "Love your wives, husbands. Love your wives, even as Christ loved the church." So even as it's, this is not brain surgery. This is even as means in the same manner. And the direct example given in the text is the example of Calvary. 
in which Christ gave himself for, for what would eventually become the church. Now, this establishes something very important. Uh, in our society, when we use the word love, we use the word love uh, as a noun most of the time. Uh, we use the, the we use the the word love to refer to an emotion, to a commitment, to a let's just say an emotion. But in the Bible, in this verse, uh, and in most of the other verses, you'd want to run. Love is not an emotion. Love is not a a it's 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 not a noun. It's a verb. It is not a feeling per se. It is an action or a habit of actions. It's a pattern of actions. For example, John 3.16, the obvious example, right? For God so loved the world. The, the particle of speech that's the verb and that is loved. And in John 3.16, love is a verb that doesn't describe a feeling. It connotates an action. You can say that the action is fruit of the feeling, but if God just sat up in heaven and had feelings towards me, well, that, 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 that accomplishes very little. I mean, John 3.16 says he loved the world, not that he had love for the world or that he has love for the world. He doesn't possess. The, the primary thing in that sentence is not that he possesses an emotion towards you, but that he acted upon that emotion, and that action is called love, not the feeling. Because the feeling by itself is just a feeling. You say, man, you're really, you're really parsing this pretty tight. Well, I'm just saying, words mean things. And like I said, if God just sat up in heaven and had you know warm fuzzies about me, that doesn't help me. I would still be on my way to hell with God having warm fuzzies about me. But God, because of his love, performed an act of love in that he gave himself on the cross of Calvary to pay for my sins and for yours. And so in a, in a headship, Jesus, church kind of typology, which is what's established in Ephesians 5, the different pieces of this typology have different obligations to each other. And we talked last time about how uh, the wife, her love, is borne out by her obedience. And on the husband's side, his love is borne out by his sacrifice. That is the nature of the relationship. <laughs> the, wife, the wife's uh, love is proven by obedience, and the love of the husband is proven by sacrifice. But it is not sacrifice uh, just for the sake of sacrifice. And I, I and this is a, this you say well, this is a minor thing. Yeah, but my, I mean, it's little foxes that spoil the vines. It's little notions that get inside. Uh, and, and taint the rest, you know, uh, was it one apple, bad apple spoils the whole barrel, or whatever the phrase is. So so we have to dig down a little bit and, and just establish that the, the sacrifice that you give in your marriage is not sacrifice just for the sake of sacrifice. Marriage is not martyrdom. It is sacrifice, but it is sacrifice for a larger purpose. Look at verse 25 again. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. At the end of verse 25 is not a period. It is a semicolon. And that means, among other things, that um, <clears throat> that verse 26 and 27 are the same sentence. <clears throat> And that the everything in verse twenty six and twenty seven is an is a, is an amplification or an explanation of what is denoted. Now I know that so many of you, you adore these little trips we take uh, through English through the the mechanics of <clears throat> English grammar, but things matter. Things are important, and so we're going to cover things that are important. So so uh, what am I doing here? Here we go. Verse 26 and verse 27 are the reasons that Christ gave himself for his bride. And just so that you don't miss it, God literally puts it in the same sentence. Calvary didn't happen <clears throat> because God the Son had nothing better to do. Calvary happened not only because God desires to redeem man, but beyond that, Calvary happened for the benefit of Jesus Christ. 
for his glory. Now, I know we don't think of it that way. But Calvary benefits me, and it does. But Calvary benefits Christ long term. And there are three things listed in verse 26 and 27 that Christ accomplished through his sacrifice. And we're going to look at all three, and we'll look at some other stuff. <clears throat> uh, sanctification, cleansing, and, and, and presentation. Um, but when Christ purchases a bride, he sanctifies a bride so that he might present it to himself a better thing than what he started with. You say, well, I don't know about that. Well, look at Hebrews 12. I can't make such a bold statement. People say, oh, I'll tell you, Jesus got nothing out of going to the cross. Actually, that's not true. Hebrews 12. Wherefore, seeing also, we also are, uh, wherefore, yeah, that's a lot of also's. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, semicolon, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. <clears throat> So he endured the cross and despised the shame for, because of, the joy that was set before him. Jesus Christ could see the cross, and Jesus Christ could see what was on the other side of the cross. And what he saw on the other side of the cross was joy. What he saw on the other side of the cross was reward for him for having accomplished what no one else could do. On the other side... Of Christ's death was life. And if we're going to love our wives as Christ loved the church, then we, it is, it is totally legitimate for you to approach your marriage with the same mindset. <clears throat> that I am going to <sighs> it is literally a biblical model for you to sacrifice for your wife to make her better, which is what Christ did with sanctification, cleansing, and presentation, and to do that for your benefit. That's literally the verse. And we say, I don't know why the Lord would save me, and I get why we say that, but the Bible tells us why. And I'm just saying as carefully as I know how that I cannot imagine there being an issue with having the same motivation in your marriage that Jesus had when he went to the cross because we know that Jesus' motives are pure. And, a, mo and, a, and, a, and a, a situation where you benefit is not an impure motivation. I mean, I eat. I ate breakfast this morning. My motivation was so I don't die. Is not dying good? Yes. Is my motivation pure? Sure. So if you don't want a better marriage just so you can have a better marriage, there's nothing wrong with that. For you to sacrifice for your wife to make her better so that she's a better wife for you, and you wind up benefiting long term, there's nothing wrong with that. That is literally why Jesus did it. And so why are you harping on that so much? Well, because there's a lot of dumb ideas out there. So you sacrifice for your wife so that she'll be a better wife. And what you get out of it is you get a better wife. Now, before we talk about what sanctify means and what cleanse means, we have to take a little side trip to Colossians 3. And we talked about this a little bit in uh, uh, the, the, the section on, on wives. Colossians 3. If I had been thinking ahead, I would have went ahead and turned to it, but I'm going to find it here. Colossians 3. I think there's a lot of bad and very subtle teaching that goes on about marriage. Um, and maybe one of these days I'll cover that. Where am I hiding Colossians at? I thought it was over here right behind, right around Ephesians. But I think there's a lot of, uh, bad, there we go. <laughs> I think there's a lot of poor, uh, uh, poor marriage teaching. And uh, let's go back to what the Bible says. Colossians 3, verse 18. You say, well, Mike, you're just contrary. Sometimes. And the struggle I have, one of the struggles I have in Bible study is I will find myself sometimes, I'm just admitting to the Bible says confess your faults one to another. I, I will sometimes um, go into a verse with a preconceived idea, and I will do everything I can to make that verse say what I want it to say instead of what it actually says. 
Having said that, I think I'm right about this one. Colossians 3, verse 18. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, so this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Uh, not with eye servant as man pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fear in God. We talked about this in part one. We talked about how God preemptively warns you against the things that you are prone to. And in verse 22, we know that servants are prone to disobedience. And in verse 20, we're, we know that children are prone to disobedience. And in verse 21, we know that fathers to, uh, uh, are prone to, to provoke their children. Uh, verse 18, we found that wives are prone to not submit. And in, in verse... Uh, 19, husbands are prone to be bitter against their wives. And it is presented as the antonym for loving her. You're told, love her, don't be bitter. Why would God say that? Because God knows you. Bitterness is a sin. And husbands get bitter against their wives because their wives aren't all they could be or should be. And God, knowing that she was going to occasionally disappoint you, said, don't you dare be bitter about it. Imagine the audacity of a man complaining to Jesus Christ about how his bride isn't what she ought to be. I mean, have you met Jesus' bride? Do you know any saved people? Do you know you? I mean, is Christ's bride ever inattentive? Does Christ's bride ever get distracted? Does Christ's bride ever have the wrong priorities? Does Christ's bride ever spend her time or her money foolishly? Does Christ's bride ever fail to do the things she should do? And is Christ ever bitter against his bride because of it? No. And because he's not, you don't get to be. You don't get to be, no matter what a flop she turns out to be, you are not allowed scripturally to be bitter against her. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. I know what it is to go to God with tears and ask for help on this very issue. And because I'm your friend, because I'm your brother, I'm telling you, it's going to eat your lunch. And the Bible knew it was going to eat your lunch. And the Bible warned you before you even had a time to think about it. Hey, this is going to be an issue. So no going in that you're not allowed to do this. I'm not saying your wife's a flop. I know some of your wives. I don't know them all. But if she is, you don't have the right to be bitter. And you don't have the right to sin against her. Because she's not what she ought to be. Because Jesus' bride is not what she ought to be. And it really is that simple. Jesus took for himself a bride that was beset by flaws and failures and sins. And he committed himself, both you know, as a group and, and as individually, to make her better than when he found her. And he does that by action. He does that by sanctifying her and cleansing her. Now we're going to make one more little side trip before we start defining things. There is a common heresy, and I, I think it qualifies as a heresy, and it drives me a little insane because I see it and not everybody else sees it, and you say, well, you're seeing things that aren't there. Maybe, maybe. Um, but there's a common heresy that, that, that your wife, that, that has talked to your wife if you're not careful, um, that, that she deserves better. That she, you know, she ought to be uh, she's not obligated to obey you unless you know you do what you're supposed to do because because she's a princess, she's the daughter of a king, and she deserves better. And and okay, fine, whatever. We talked about it in part one. Another heresy that is beaten into the skulls of men that I think is 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 wrong is that if you were simply a better husband, she would automatically be a better wife. Uh, there was a movie that came out a few years back, and it really grieved me, and I got irritated with it, and I, and I, and I, and I complained about it a bunch because that really complaint is the only thing I'm good at and uh, it was uh, I don't know it was like courageous or bulletproof or fireproof or, or, or flame retardant or so I don't, I don't know it was, you know there was a period there in the early I don't know 2000s it feels like 
where there was a bunch of movies that came out that all had Kirk Cameron in them, and they all kind of were saying the same movie, and they were a an hour and a half long sermon, and they were just kind of lame. You know, I don't know why Christians make lame movies, but we do. And in one of these, the dude, uh, Kirk Cameron's character, he was a guy who was a complete blockhead. And um, he, he went and did this, like, love challenge to do these things for his wife for 30 days or something. And, and his marriage was on the rocks, and he was married to this, this gal who, and he was looking at bad stuff on the internet. And, and, and she was, she was, uh, I was a nurse or a, something. There was a doctor in the story somehow. Used car salesman, uh, veterinarian, uh, traveling salesman, uh, something. And so she was eyeballing this other man. And the story, the movie, very much to me, treated that as if uh, her, because Kirk Cameron was such a terrible husband, that her, her eyeball on this other dude was the natural result, and almost, almost like he shouldn't be surprised that she's got this other dude on the string because he's such a he's such a deadbeat. <coughs> Excuse me, and and it sort of was taught it was sort of presented like that her sin was the result of his sin. And that if he did better, she would do better. And I think that's a bunch of poppycock. As, as, as Joe Biden would say, it's a bunch of malarkey. Your sin is never anyone else's fault but yours. Okay, let's take it off the wires. Let's put it on us. Let's say... Uh, you know, in 1 Corinthians 7, we're not going to cover it. I mean, I guess we are covering it now. In 1 Corinthians 7, it talks about the responsibility, the physical responsibilities that husbands and wives have to each other because they are joint owners of each other's bodies. And we're not, like I said, we're not going to cover that because that's the whole thing by itself. But if you haven't read it in a while, it's I think it's uh, verse 3 or 4, somewhere up in there. And how that you do not have the right to your own body anymore when you get married in a physical sense. And that you cannot deprive your spouse of the use of your body. And yet that goes on in Christian homes, in Christian marriages all the time. I, I'm just telling you, ask around, pay attention. You'll see that it is a recurring theme. And there's lots of reasons why that is. And we're not going to go into all that. But, but so, so let's say you, sir are your wife is not taking care of things behind closed doors like she should or like she used to or or whatever you are not justified then to satisfy those urges someplace else you cannot stand before god and say i did that because of her inattentiveness and i think i think we both agree i think we all agree on that I think if a guy came to you and said, hey, I've got this going on in my life, but it's her fault. Now, I get I get that blaming your wife for things is literally the original family tradition in the human family, in Adam's family. But it was wrong when he did it, and it's wrong when you do it. It's wrong when I do it. Your sin is your fault, not her fault. Now, she might have set you up for failure, blah, 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 whatever, whatever, whatever. <laughs> but that does not justify what you're doing. Now, I chased that for several minutes there just because that, that, that situation in that movie irritated me so much that here it is. I can't even remember the name of the movie, but I remember how irritated I was. And so the idea that in that movie was that once Kirk Cameron became a better husband, his, his, his wife automatically straightened up and became the model wife. And that's not how it works out in the real world a lot of times. And because I care about you... Uh, and because I want to see you have the best judgment seat of Christ possible, I'm going to tell it to you straight. I'm not James Dobson. I'm not going to tell you if you straighten up and fly right, she'll straighten up and fly right in response to you. That's not true. And you know how you know that's not true? You know that's not true because Jesus Christ is the perfect husband and his wife is sometimes a train wreck. So, well, Mike, you're telling me that I can do right and, and she still won't do right sometimes? Yes. You can do everything right and your wife can still do wrong. Yes. You can be perfectly attentive to her and she may still be inattentive to you. Yes. You can sacrifice for her. You can sanctify her. You can cleanse her. You can do all the things we're going to talk about that you're supposed to do. And you can still have a wife 
that is not who she ought to be. Yes. And so you do the right thing because it is the right thing. And you can do it with a goal in mind. You can do it with the goal of bettering your wife. You can do it with the goal of improving your wife. Because that's why Jesus does it. But your wife is a person, and people do what they want. And so when Jesus' bride disobeys, his response is to do right. And when his bride fails, his response is to do right. And her response, his response to all of her shortcomings is to do right. So you, sir, have the distinction and the commission to do right no matter what she does. And brother, that is a mountain that can sit on a man's back. I'll I'll say this, and this is this is mostly my opinion. I think it's I think it's backed up by scripture. A wife in First Peter three is promised that God will try to re, if she'll do right. Her her disobedient husband, disobedient to God, not to her. Her disobedient husband, that God will try if she if she submits himself, herself unto her, unto him in the proper way. She has a promise from God that God will try to reach that man through her. Right? First Peter 3. We talked about it last time. I don't think a man has the same promise. Because our typology, our role in this typology is we're the Jesus side of the equation. And the Jesus side of the equation gets the short end of the stick a lot of times. So you can do things to improve her, but you don't have the promises that a wife has in 1 Peter 3. But you do right because it's, it's right to do. Now here's an interesting little biblical nugget about husbands and husbandry. You know that word, right? You've heard that word before, husbandry, like someone is engaged in animal husbandry. A uh, husband is also a, a, a verb. We don't use it that way a whole lot uh, in modern English, but to husband something is to is to manage it or cultivate. Well, I'm going to show you some examples. Uh, Zechariah 13. Zechariah 13 is somewhere in here. I know it is. Zechariah. There we are. Uh, 13 verse 5. Oh, verse 4, And it shall come to pass in that day the prophet shall be ashamed of everyone's vision. When he hath prophesied, neither shall he wear a rough garment to deceive. Verse 5, But he shall say, this is the prophet, I am no prophet, I am an husbandman, for man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. So a husbandman is someone who manages cattle, right? Well, look at James 5 in your New Testament, towards the back there. James 5, uh, looks like it's verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. So, so you, have, you have a guy who's, a, who's managing cattle, cultivating them, breeding them, providing for them, and he's called a husbandman. You have a man who's in charge of a, an orchard of some kind, producing fruit. And that man is also referred to as being a husband. In 2 Timothy 2, the Bible says, 2 Timothy 2, verse 6, The husband that laboreth must first must be first partaker of the fruits. So you got cowboys and you got farmers. And they're both referred to as husbands. Now if you dig a little bit deeper in Genesis 9, Genesis 9, that's easier to find. If you hit the table of contents, you've gone too far. Genesis 9, verse 20, I think it is. <clears throat> and Noah began to be a husbandman and planted a vineyard. 
So a husbandman is someone who who cultivates, who takes care of, of, of the growing of something, the development of something. It's used several times to, to describe someone who's growing vegetables or fruit. And right here is described specifically as a guy who tends to a vine. Noah became a husbandman and he grew a vineyard. He was tending to vines. Now in, in Isaiah 54, we're not going to turn there because we are swiftly running out of time. Um, uh, God calls himself Israel's husband. And in uh, Jeremiah 2 and in Jeremiah 6, he calls her, he refers to Israel as being a vine. In fact, there's a place in uh, Isaiah where uh, he talks about uh, how she's uh, wild grapes. Or as Ian Paisley says, wild grapes. <coughs> now with all that in mind, with all that groundwork laid, let's look at Psalm 128, <clears throat> Psalm 128, I'm over here trying not to die, <clears throat> verse 3, ah, verse 1, Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways, for thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Okay, so we're talking about a farmer. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children, like olive plants, round about thy table. Behold, that thus shall the man be that blessed, be blessed that feareth the Lord. So your wife, <clears throat> in typology, is a vine. <clears throat> and you are the man tasked with tending to that vine cultivating it and making it fruitful. So let me tell you a story from the annals and files of Mike Alford's personal life. <clears throat> we, uh, we, we grow some food out here because for a couple of reasons, um, just because we like to be able to walk out in the yard and get our own food and not have to go to the grocery store and it's cheaper and it's, you know, it's, it's good for you and everything. So I planted some cucumbers. Now cucumbers, if you don't know this, cucumbers are a vine. And I put up a little thing for them to climb up on, but because of other things that were going on, these <laughs> these vines got away from me. And um, what you're supposed to do as, as the vine grows, you're supposed to dress the vine. And by that, I mean you take the vine and you, you tie it off to a structure. That does some things for you. Um, that What that does for the plant is it gives actually gives the plant more room to grow because if it just grows on top of itself, it just makes a big tangled mess. And when it is a big tangled mess, um, it will still produce fruit. But the problem is you're going to have a time finding that fruit because the fruit is the same color as the leaves. I mean, that's not hard to figure out, right? So you dress these vines out so that they, so you can find the fruit, so the, so the more leaves get access to more sun, so the pollinators can get to the leaves, to the flowers more easily. There's a lot of benefits to dress them out. In fact, there's no benefit to not dressing it out. <laughs> and so, uh, if you if you dress it out properly, um, it will you'll be able to find the fruit, and there'll be more fruit. And the other thing about a cucumber plant, I don't know if it's true about every kind of vine, but but cucumber plants, they they uh, the the point of the plant is to make the fruit, right? I mean that's why God made the plant so that it could make the fruit in the fruit of the seeds for more plants, right? That's how God set that thing up. And so once the <clears throat> Once the plant has made a sufficient amount of fruit, it is at liberty to die, having fulfilled its purpose, okay? And the, the, the plant judges when it's made enough fruit, when its fruit ripens and stays ripe for a certain amount of time on the vine, the plant decides, I'm done, I can die now. So you sort of trick the plant. You pick the cucumbers just a little bit early, and the plant says to itself, and I'm, I know I'm giving agency to a plant that does not have agency. I know I'm, I'm attributing thoughts to a plant that does not have thoughts, but just, just hang with me here. The plant will say, oh, I better, I better, I'm not done because I'm not have matured fruit yet, so I need to put out more flowers and put up more fruit. And you can get probably twice as much out of a cucumber plant if you're paying attention. But if you let that thing get away from you just a little bit, 
what will happen is you'll ha you won't dress it out. You'll have fruit everywhere. You won't be able to find it. And some of that fruit will ripen and stay on the vine just a day or two too long. And all of a sudden you realize your plant is dying. There's nothing you can do to reverse that process. The plant has decided to stop trying. So my point is if you cultivate it and you're a husband to this vine, you will see the fruit that it's producing and it will have more fruit than it did if you just let it run wild on its own. It'll still produce, produce some fruit, but not as much and not and for not as long. And hopefully that analogy holds up in your life the way it does in mine. Now, so you cultivate your wife in order so that her life might bear fruit. And that fruit is done is that fruit is a blessing to you. That fruit is a benefit to you. It's a benefit to her, but it's also a benefit to you. And you cultivate your your wife by doing right by her, regardless of the outcome, you do right by her the same way Jesus Christ does by you. And your goal ought to be to, able to either, either have a fruitful wife or to be able to stand at the judgment seat of Christ and say, I did everything you told me to do, Lord, and this is what happened. And so you do right by her the same way Jesus, right, Jesus Christ does right by you, and you accomplish that by sacrifice, by sanctification, by cleansing, by nourishing, and by cherishing. And all those are in Ephesians 5, which we just read. Now, we got we to gotta wrap this thing up here. We're going to run through the definitions real quick. <laughs> uh, sanctification, to sanctify something is to set it apart for a purpose. You see that in the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis, when God set the, se the seventh day apart, he sanctified it. Okay? It's, it, is, it is the only thing that is different about that seventh day is the fact that God set it aside. The, the sun doesn't come up any different on the seventh day. The sky is in a different color. But God set that thing apart. And there's nothing magical or mystical about sanctification. I have a, a shovel that is sanctified to dig holes with. I don't use it for a pogo stick. I don't use it to shoot pool with. It is sanctified. It is set apart for that purpose. So your wife is sanctified. Jesus Christ set aside his bride for his glorification, for his good pleasure. Your wife is unique. Your wife is, is set apart, and you ought to be mindful of the fact that she is unique, and she is set apart for the purpose. And a lot more can be said about that. But that's what Jesus Christ does for you. That's what you're supposed to do for her. The uh, Bible says he cleanses it. Uh, Jesus does this by by um, by spiritually ministering to her, specifically Ephesians five with his words. Uh, and all I can say about that is, uh, if the shoe fits, wear it, friend. I have a friend of mine, and uh, he told me we're talking about some of these issues, and he told me how he had decided that what he was going to do was he was going to send, because he has a text message thing or whatever he's got. I don't, I don't have things. Um, but he has a thing, and what he was going to do is he was going to send these, he was gonna, just going to text Bible verses to his wife. And that was how he was going to cleanse her. He had, it, was, it was an ongoing ministry he was going to have for his wife. And they've, they've had a rough time of it. Plenty of blame to go around. But he was going to try to fix his end of it by using the words of Jesus Christ to minister to her. And I said, man, look, that sounds like a great idea. I wish I thought of it. And I said, let me know how it works out. And, and so, you know. But at the very least, if you're not going to do that, you can spiritually minister her with your words. Because it's one of the jobs God's given you to do. That's how you cultivate her. That's how you get her to bear fruit. That's how you get her to become better than what she is now. You got to put in the work, boss. There ain't no way around it. And nourishing. Let's look at let's look at just, let's look at a definition of nourishing. That's not a word we use a whole lot uh, in modern day vernaculars. Uh, Genesis fifty. Genesis fifty. Verse 21, the Bible says, Now therefore fear not, I will nourish you and your little ones. What does that mean? Well, the next sentence. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. A lot of this stuff overlaps. A lot of this stuff 
is kind of the same thing, just with a slightly different word. And in, in Isaiah 44, I have that written down. Let me turn to it. Isaiah 44. The Bible says in verse 14, He he heweth down he he heweth that's a lot of H's he heweth him down cedars and taketh the cypress and the oak which he strengthened for himself among the trees of the forest he planteth an ash and the rain doth nourish it so so to nourish something is to uh, comfort that thing to nourish something means to provide for to give it what it needs sir you have an obligation to give your wife what she needs. Let me scratch this itch. I believe, and I've said this before, that the philosophy and the mindset behind happy wife, happy life, as long as mama's happy, everybody else happy, I think that is foolishness. I think that is destructive because it puts the woman in charge, among other things. But there's a, there, you are, you're not obligated to give her what she wants, but you are obligated by Scripture to give her what she needs. And that is called nourishing her, and that is what Jesus Christ does for you, so that's what you're supposed to do for her. Isn't the Bible fun? Doesn't the Bible just run contrary to everything about you sometimes? You know why guys like looking at naked pictures of people on the internet? or, or Well, that's the way to do it now. But, you know, that wasn't always the way you did it. But the reason guys like that, well, you say, well, men are visual creatures. Sure, that's part of it. But the reason that appeals to guys is being a husband is a ton of work. And if you could get at least some of the benefit or a simulated version of some of the benefit without any of the work, that appeals to everything about your flesh. Well, that one was free. And we said that Jesus cherishes you, and so you should cherish her. Now, cherishing is a synonym uh, for uh, uh, for um, nourishing, at least according to First Thessalonians two, it is. But there is a tender. Well, let's look at First Thessalonians two. Uh, there's a tenderness associated with it. Like you know, the rain comes down and nourishes the plants, but the rain doesn't, you know. The rain doesn't care. The rain is doing the thing that it does. The rain is not cognizantly uh, uh, deciding to, to be encouraging and uplifting and edifying to the plant. It's just falling out of the sky because of gravity. But if you look in 1 Thessalonians 2, Paul is describing his ministry. And it says, But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth, her children. So to cherish something is to nourish it, but to nourish it with a, a, an affection, to nourish it with a tenderness. It's not just watering the plant, it's watering the plant, you know, while while talking to it and, and, and pulling aphids off of it. And so the back to Ephesians 5 as we're trying desperately to find a landing spot here. Ephesians 5 tells us, goes on to say, there's actually more uh, uh, definite or more more commandments given to the the men, the husbands in Ephesians five than the women. Looks like to me. I, mean, I, I could do a word count, I guess, if you want me to, but I'm, I'm probably not going to do that right now, <laughs> and probably not later on either. Um, but it says, uh, verse twenty: So men ought men ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. So a good rule of thumb. There's really two rules of thumb, and fortunately for you unless you've been in some horrible industrial accident, you probably have two thumbs already. So on one thumb, you could say, I'm going to do for her what Jesus does for me. Okay? Specifically the things that he, he lists in Ephesians 5. You know, uh, sacrificing, and sanctification, and cleansing, and nourishing, and cherishing. And on the other thumb, you could say, I'm going to take care of my wife, and I'm going to be a good husband by doing for my wife what I would do for myself. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever hateth his, uh, yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, 
even as the Lord the church. So that's your two thumbs. Do it because Jesus did it. Do it because I would do it for myself. <laughs> I tell you, man, I, when I first got saved and I started reading, I started reading the book of Proverbs and I, and I didn't know any Bible, but I knew human nature. And I was like, I would read through Proverbs and I would just be amazed at the preemptive uh, warnings that God is not like after the fact. God says before the fact, here's what you're like. And if you're not careful, here's what you'll do. And I'm telling you now, don't do it. And I used to read through Proverbs and I'd be like, man, whoever wrote this, because I wouldn't, I don't know that I thought a whole lot about inspiration and preservation and the authorship of the words and whose words are these and are these are these Paul's words, are these the Holy Ghost words? Are they both? I hadn't thought that stuff through, but I knew that whoever wrote Proverbs had their finger right on the pulse of how people really are. And I'd read a lot of dumb philosophy and a bunch of dead philosophy about how men ought to be. But this was the Bible was the first book I I had ever read, I think, where it, it it dealt with men the way they are. And so, you know, whatever that's worth to you. Uh, <laughs> we're going to finish up here. Verse 33 of Ephesians 5. It says, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Well, there you go. There you go. You love your wife as, as you love yourself and she reverences you, reverences you and both of you will live lives that are pleasing to God. And at 46 minutes and change, I made it through this. I'm going to go get myself an ice cream. Thank you for listening, all four of you. Thank you for joining us on this, this trip through this topic. Tell your friends, tell your neighbors, do something for Jesus Christ, and I will see you on the other side.